I've had a really great team working with me on this project at St. Lucie Reef. In contrast to the three, uh, or excuse me, three presentations we've just seen, this is a bit more of a focused project. Uh, it was a one-time funding from the specialty license plates, but we've been able to expand that with multiple sources over the past three years. Um, my primary collaborator on this has been Jeff Beal from FWC. He's the one that really got me interested in St. Lucie Reef uh, after I came to Harbor Branch, and I've had a really great team of students and staff to help with this project. And it's really been ultimately a partnership between Harbor Branch, FWC, and St. Lucie Inlet State Park. So the area that we're talking about is just south of St. Lucie Inlet. There's an aerial shot there on the right. It's a relatively shallow habitat, and we call it a northern coral reef, but really it's more of a worm rock reef that's been colonized by some corals. It's very unlike what you would see for a coral reef in the Florida Keys, for example. This area gets tons of input from various different sources. In addition to these main canals that impact the St. Lucie estuary, there are also tertiary inputs from smaller canals or unregulated runoff that go into the system. And ultimately, the result is that during times of heavy rains or times of the locks being opened, we get these freshwater discharge events that flow into St. Lucie estuary, then out through the inlet and can persist on the reef for weeks up to even a month. And during that time, you get these distinctive black water events as the water moves out of the inlet. Uh, originally, we thought that, that water predominantly always moved south. We now have some evidence to the contrary that it may at times go straight east. Uh, we're trying to track that a little bit better using some aerial techniques that I'll talk about at the very end. So the real question is, what happens with these freshwater discharges once you get beyond the inlet? A lot of the work that we've seen earlier today and a lot of the work that's been done by the water management districts has been focused on the effects of those discharges within the lagoon system. But very little time and effort and money has been spent on looking at those discharge impacts once you move beyond the inlets. So since 2010, we've been trying to track potential effects of those discharges on corals and the reef communities that are present in St. Lucie Inlet State Park. So we've established four different sampling locations, north, central, ledge, and south. Uh, as you might imagine, ledge was added a little bit later, otherwise it would have had a different name. Um, but we've been able to track the individual fate of coral colonies at these sites. So we've gone back and sampled the same corals time after time, as well as looked at the overall community structure in those areas to see if there's any differences overall. And this reef is kind of unique because it's not what we think of as a true coral reef in the sense of built by predominantly coral structure, but it has very high biodiversity. Uh, it has a confluence of both tropical and temperate fish species. Those are, there's at least 250 different fish species present at this reef. Very high productivity um, in some of the macroalgal communities. Uh, not a very dominant sponge community, which is somewhat interesting for reefs in the Florida Keys or excuse me, reefs in Florida in general. And it's really the northernmost limit along the coastline for about 21 coral species. So there's roughly 25 or 26 coral species that are present in St. Lucie Inlet State Park. As soon as you go north of the inlet, 21 of those coral species disappear. Only four or five persist north of the inlet. So it is this breaking point, and there's something unique about this area that's giving rise to this community. And we're interested in, number one, how is it persisting? Number two, what are the impacts of these discharges? And we also know that this is a really key fisheries resource. Uh, in addition to seeing lots of tarpon, seeing lots of grouper at this site, we also see lots of fishermen at this site just about every time we go, especially during kingfish and mackerel season. So as a reminder, this is a state park, so it is a protected area, but it's not protected from all forms of fishing. So you can't do big purse staining in this area any longer, but they still can do hook and line, and they can still use cast nets, which can effectively uh, be used similar to a gill net, but not quite. So one of the ways to track this water discharge is to look at changes in salinity over time. And for those of you that saw me give a presentation related to this project last year, I went on a mini rant about Hobo's salinity loggers and how they were completely ineffective for our application and gave us very poor quality data or failed within a matter of weeks. 
So we've replaced those hobos with another unit from New Zealand, the Odysseys, that's performed very well. Uh, the other side benefit is that the Odyssey was half price, so we were able to get double the amount. And we finally got those installed in October of last year. And you can see on the top panel here, this is salinity at each of our different sites, including the inlet. The inlet is that kind of deep red color over time. And you'll see that there are these persistent drops in salinity at different times, and that those drops in salinity in the inlet are mirrored by drops in salinity at our research stations as well. So that gave us really strong evidence that not just anecdotally do we notice black water extending out over the reef, but there is a signal of fresh water getting out to the reef that persists for a period of time after fresh water moves out of the inlet. So our next question is, where is that water coming from? And if you look here at discharges, so this is flow rate out of those different control structures and the different locks that I showed on the initial map. And what you'll notice is that we do have increases in flow rate from C44, 23, and 24 canals that's related to this January drop in salinity. But we also have a negative flow rate at the lake. So what that means is that lots of water was pouring into the St. Lucie Estuary Basin, some of which was being directed into the estuary itself, some of which was actually being directed by the district back into the lake. So it's not always a flow from the lake into the estuary kind of problem, which is somehow how, it, sometimes how it gets characterized in the media. But you can see quite clearly that these are related to rainfall events. Now, does anyone know what's missing from this map, or excuse me, from this graph? Wet season. Essentially, this is dry season of this past year, November through May. So now that we're entering wet season, it'll be interesting to see as this rainfall starts to increase, how we'll be able to track potential changes at St. Lucie. In addition to tracking the, the water quality, or excuse me, the water salinity itself, we've been looking at corals and their relative health complements. We've been targeting two species, Pseudodiploria clavosa and Montastri cavernosa. They're the two dominant coral species on this reef. And remember that most coral species house endosymbiotic zooxanthellae or algae that allow them to grow and persist and survive. So, these you've seen before, gene expression, the bacterial communities on the surface of the coral, and those, those zooxanthellae within the coral are what we've been tracking. The things that we've changed recently, gene expression we were initially doing microarrays. And although we were able to detect some increases in stress-related genes during summer discharge events, those were concomitant with increases in temperature at the same time. So it's hard to tease apart the differences between genes that are responding to the discharge versus genes that are responding to the temperature. So by using an RNA-seq approach, it should give us a bit more resolution relative to the genes that are being turned on and off and get a, a little bit better picture of how these corals are responding. For bacterial communities, uh, the ability for us to resolve those communities has increased rapidly relative to technology. So rather than doing profiling, just looking at overall pictures of the community, we can now look at individual components of the community. So we're moving towards the next generation sequencing approach. For the Zos and Delhi, uh, Courtney Claypack uh, was able to develop a next generation sequencing approach, and I'll show you some of that data here in just a minute. And then the thing that we've also added is a coral genotyping approach using microsatellites that we can actually look at the individual components of each of these corals, where they come from relative to other places uh, within the South Florida region, as well as which of those may be more resistant to discharge stress. So in terms of zooxanthellae density, or the number of zooxanthellae per unit area on a coral, you'll see that the two species are quite different from one another, but that over time, they're relatively consistent. And even during discharge events in the summer and fall of 2013, there really wasn't any increase in the total number of zooxanthellae. So the species are different. The sites are not very different from one another, so there's no gradient effect over this uh, region and they're relatively stable over time. So those in failure are not a good indicator for looking at discharge response. If we look at the types of those in failure that are present, this is really interesting. So the cavernosa basically is dominated by this one type called type C. You can think of that as a species type of those in failure, whereas the pseudodiploria dominated by type B, which is a completely different type. Again, relatively stable over time, but the interesting thing here is that some of these associations between these types, particularly the type CX2 over there on the right, 
are probably completely novel associations that have not been observed in this system at all before or in corals at all. And again, no changes as a result of discharges. So to summarize, we've had really significant increases in coral stress genes that are, uh, occur during the summer, but we can't tease apart discharge events versus thermal stress. I didn't present this data because you've seen it before, but we know that they harbor dynamic microbial assemblages that are unique from other places in the Caribbean. New things for this year, we know now that freshwater discharges are traceable throughout St. Lucie Reef and that they correlate with both heavy rains and lock discharge events or lock releases. We know that the different types and the density of zooxanthellae differ between the two coral species, but are relatively consistent over time. So that might mean that they're fairly resilient in face of these discharge events, which is good. And we may be looking at some relatively novel symbioses between corals and these zooxanthellae. So some ongoing work, uh, we're, we really need to look at the gene copy numbers in those zooxanthellae so we can get better estimates of the relative number because one of the performance metrics might not be just who you have, but how much of who you have. So Jennifer Polinsky is going to be doing some work with that. Alicia Shatters is working on an ex situ mesocosm where we'll independently dose temperature and discharge water, both independently and in com uh, combination, to look at which of those result in stress and whether or not there's any synergistic stresses. We're going to be using uh, an unmanned aerial vehicle AKA drone, it's the word you're not supposed to mention, uh, to survey these discharge events a bit more effectively. And then lastly, uh, we've gotten a lot of support recently from the Southeast Florida Coral Reef Initiative and the district in Martin County to start doing more water quality monitoring at the site itself. So with the addition of the Lobo Network and the South Indian River Lagoon and some additional water quality monitoring on the reef, we should have a much better picture of the overall water quality for the estuary and the reef. Overall goal, better data, more effective management by combining all three techniques. We've done lots of leveraging, but basically these are all things that have grown out of that initial $200,000 investment. Thank you.